Okay, so I'm just going to do this. Okay, that's me in the top. If you care to tweet, you care to connect, you care to post a question, if you care to just care more, you can reach me there. My teammate is Ray Palomi. She's new to Twitter, but active and interested and wanting to share her story. And right now, the hashtag is us, so we are access. So much of our ideas and room designs and stuff, we post that hashtag. So if you wish to see the space that I come from and meet the other person that works with me and see what some of the other conversations have been prior to this moment, I encourage you to go there. Give you a five, four, three, two, one. And now you just have to message each other, right? But I'll land there at the end so you can go back to it. Okay, so <clears throat> yesterday, before, as I was packing up the classroom, it was about maybe two o'clock, we get a phone call. When I say we, it's myself and Pam, we get a phone call. It's from our central administrator and the central administrator saying, uh, there is a student that has been suspended. The parent will be contacting you shortly. We need for you to set up an intake. That sets in motion a whole bunch of little steps where we wait for the parent for 24 hours and then we reach out and we say, hey, we've heard a thing happened. We need to set up some programming with your child. Could you come in and meet us? We may or may not get that meeting right away. We may or may not get that meeting right away, but when we do, the student comes in, we sit down with the parent, the guardian, the supporter, the someone, and we try and figure out what programming is going to look like for the student. Once that meet and greet has been meant and papers have been signed off and behavior norms have all been talked about and we shine up the opportunity for our program, it could be a couple days before we actually get programming going. The conditions of participating in ACCESS, which is alternative classroom with counseling um, for expelled and suspended students, is that when a student is suspended, we are dependent on the home school to get curriculum, to get lesson planning, to get ideas, to get the information that we need to help this child. Now, we have a whole lot of resources in the room. I am in my second year of this program, but Access in itself has been in motion for a lot longer than that. So if you're to walk into the space as a brand, not accidentally, mind you, but if you were uh, hired to be a part of this team, part of this group, you would walk in and you would see a classroom with books and resources and photocopies and a lot of ideas on the shelf. But often that's not the context that the kid came from. That's if you need it. That's if you get the phone call that says, by the way, you have a kid coming by tomorrow. Now, backtrack for a second. Our classroom has a cap of 16 kids. It is a secondary classroom, so we could have students in grade 9, 10, 11, or 12, 12 plus, potentially. And when they come to us, if they are coming to us and ultimately going to be us for four periods a day, that's four different courses. And if we have 16 different kids across four different levels, you could do the uh, calculations there. That's a whole lot of different courses. And if we happen to have a busy Tuesday, where we're getting a lot of calls, it says, by the way, you have a few intakes that are coming down the pipe. This is the reality of the classroom. This is the reality of a classroom in our context for suspended and expelled students. So this question comes up a lot. I think from the frame of mind, I'm going to make sort of like school board parental administrator, maybe framed slightly differently. Do you know why you were suspended? And that for some might be a good on-ramp to starting to do some restorative work for the child, maybe to own their decisions, to start to build that longer term rapport, to get to some healing, to get to some understanding, to get to some wellness, to get them back to whatever reality they are leaving. But in that exact same moment, they say, and by the way, you're going to access. So it's interesting to receive a child that comes into our context, because in some ways, this is, I'm sorry, for some students, they've already left the system willingly, maybe through behavior, maybe through disengagement, maybe because they just have a busy life and they can't make it to school. But now intentionally, they're being removed from the system. So the student coming to us, this isn't necessarily uphill because my colleague and I 
listen a lot. So getting student voice for a student that we're just meeting and we have to, we're, basically we have to build a grade 12 relationship with a student based on some really crumbly pieces that they're carrying in their backpack. So once we get the curriculum and we get them started and we get them in, so they're gonna comply with our day, which is 9 a.m. to 2.30, we're in together all day long. The bathroom is across the hall. There are no breaks to sort of go out for a smoke. We do have wellness breaks where we may go outside for a walk, but it is connected all day long. But the funny thing happens when you get to that space, you start to get to know each other and you start to get the backstory and you start to realize the conditions that brought the child to you are longstanding, potentially. Um, they might be controversial, there may be victims, but it's still a child that is connected to a broader school system. And this makes this very complex. And throughout the next few slides, I want you to consider why weren't you suspended? Like specifically, the 58 pairs of eyes looking at me. Why weren't you suspended? What was your context or your lived experience? What were the protective elements that kept you from being suspended? And some of you may know or not know, in Ontario, you can be suspended for not getting your shots. You can pull a suspension because you have, you're not up to date in your specific shots. So there are different injections you have to have. So if you have busy parents, you could have come and worked with me. Which is a really interesting way to look at being suspended or not. But I want to challenge your thinking just a little bit. When I first started the, the work that I do and the body of work that I do, I've been, I, I, Stephen alluded to it, I was a chef before I started teaching. When I came into teaching, I was fortunate because I had an undergraduate degree and at the time they're like, hey, tech teacher, awesome. Hey, tech teacher that you can teach tech and we give you every other course to teach as well. Because by coming with the tech certificate and the undergraduate, they say, that's a, I didn't know it was a great commodity. I just thought there was something super special about me. But like Francois said, I'm no superhero. I just got a job real easy. And when I share that story, they're like, really? You didn't have to do LTO, really? You didn't have to do substitute teaching? I didn't. I got in. So I started to teach hospitality, and I was connected with a hospitality program in a regular high school, whatever that means, but a regular high school. And I was also in connected with what they called the target program, which was a behavioral program. So it was a package deal for 11 and 12 students. I just happened to be the chef that was going to teach them the whole knives. So I started to meet a lot of individuals, little individuals, that reminded me of some of the staff that I had worked with in restaurants. And there were some interesting dots that started to get connected because I was seeing the full timeline of a child's life. I was seeing the full timeline of choices. And I was seeing the full timeline of where certain systems maybe didn't match up to the reality and definitely didn't match up directly to the dreams of some of these kids. Because I had a whole lot of conversations with students as young chefs and cooks that went a little something like this. I just moved here from another country and I'm trying to bring my family. On the weekend, I was trying to get my child to daycare and I was driving a little bit fast. I got a ticket. I lost the daycare. I can't come into work tomorrow. I got stories like, I'm working a second job. That's why I wasn't uh, on time this morning. And then I meet these kids in high school, and the stories were eerily similar. It was around that time as well I discovered something from the Search Institute called 40 Assets. And it's a really fascinating look at what are the protective elements that don't ensure that you get everything you want in life, but they definitely set you up for some sort of success. And it's kind of interesting to me because I think the document in itself, the survey in itself, is at least a decade old, and I've never come across it more than that I'm getting in there. I've never come across it in any formal PD session. I've never had it referenced to me. And I'm not like doing the rounds like I've done them all over Ontario. But when you get little bits of that that are like source code, I wonder why isn't it presented? It talks about internal and external elements that keep your life on track. You're still gonna have bumps, you're still have interesting stuff happen, but you're more likely to succeed. So when I start to think about some of the steps that we've taken in program, Pam and myself, that's the CYW I work with, we constantly ask this question, is that do we in our hearts believe that an expulsion is part of restorative practice? And for each one of you in your jurisdictions, 
you know, I encourage you to tweet back out to me or to Pam because I've spent the last about six months reaching out to diff different jurisdictions and it's really hard to find my people. It's really hard for me to find, and, and that could just be Twitter, it's contextual, but it's really hard for me to find others that are doing the same work that we do. And we want to build capacity and we want better practice, not best, we want better practice and we want to be connected so we can share resources. But we come to that question, is expulsion a restorative practice? So the context that I come into teaching, what the eyes that I come into teaching is that if you work hard, good stuff will happen. This is entirely based on my learned experience of being a chef. It's entirely based on also my belief system around school. When I was going through high school myself, I didn't really care about high school. Real life for me was working in restaurants. I had it completely inverted. My part-time job was school. So I was working in restaurants at night and doing school during the day. I knew the line. I knew my marks I had to get, and at the time I was fortunate in that transition time between OAC, 13 OAC, I got into university. Yay me. Again, I go back to the, the 40 assets, I go back to my protective context, I go back to having that one person, like the one that shows up with a kid at our intake meeting, that was standing with me. And fortunate to have both parents that supported my lifestyle. Not saying I didn't do the stuff. And if I ask myself, why wasn't I suspended? I'll just leave that hanging in the air. <laughs> but I ha we always have to work to see beyond our context and especially our learned, our learned experience. So if I were to go further down that path and say to every single one of my new students that if you just work hard, you're gonna make it through this expulsion and suspension because that's not necessarily a truth. So once we move beyond the compliance piece, which is showing up 9 a.m., whatever the start day is, we've got our curriculum in, we've connected with the parents, we have a pipeline of planning coming from the home school, we get the kid in the classroom, then we realize that everything we've done so far doesn't matter. It matters, but it doesn't matter in that moment. Because the process of getting to know a child and figuring out what motivates them, what keeps them centered, what makes them anxious, what makes them make their decisions, what gets them into that trigger spot, just just before they go off, maybe just before that moment that sent them to us in the first place. That's the sweet spot. And that's where we spend most of our time. That's where we spend 90% of our time. And we've started to say wellness before curriculum. There's a strange phenomenon that I hear time and time again in the conversations about some of the students that come to us and they do wanna be students and they wanna be children and they want to be, I'm going to say, our children when they look to us as parents or their guardian or their connectedness. They want to be a friend, perhaps. And we find ourselves falling into a trap of having to qualify for the exact support that we so knowingly have in front of us. And I've been in those conversations once or twice, like somehow the resource that we know we should use, there's a qualifying agent for it. And I always sit plunk down in the middle of that and I say, the kid is already here. The kid has already done something. Our job now is to connect the dots. Plain and simple. So I'm a bit of a pack rat. I went from teaching hospitality and behavior into guidance and then into special education. And then I went into alternative education. And then now I'm in this term, it's a three year term. I'm in my second year of it in um, will access. We've named the program, but ostensibly we're working with students on suspension and expulsion. There's a third piece as well, students that are placed. So a student can be placed if there is no plan yet. So earning the assets was never an issue for me. Because I've had the luxury of being in a bunch of different programs, I grab from any, everywhere. I was also the one that would run, run that line during um, comment season, midterm and interim, where I'm looking at the guidance comments, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Those work really well for my hospitality class. So I'd use them. Or I would be saying to, um, at one of our student success meetings, hey, I've heard about this thing that we use in something called supervised alternative learning, which is a SAL, a different program. I know no one's using that right now. Can I use that in alt ed? So if I have a superpower, and Francoise were so vividly presented up here, that energy, that sort of seeing the students for who they are, which I think many educators that are wholehearted, they do. Mine in particular is connecting dots that nobody's paying attention to. 
And if I take that as the met, if I take that for the metaphor for my program, that's the important work. That's the important work right there. Because us, as positionally empowered, we see these things. And I have no doubt that you've been on the other side of a budget line and you've seen a resource that isn't being used. You could say effectively, but maybe just not used. But it's been a portion there, or it's been put there. I watch for those moments and I go for them for my kids. So we spend a lot of time not only doing curriculum, and from a kid's point of view, you could be sitting there and saying, oh my gosh, I'm doing geo, they're doing English, that kid over there is doing math. That can be really exciting. It can also be really hard to manage. And in that classroom, we do a lot of what's called hummingbird teaching. So we try and design active, engaging lessons and activities that allow us to kind of get up and sit down and then get up and sit down and then get up and sit down and do it all over again. We wear our running shoes because that's what we're doing. But that's also what the program needs. And it also needs individuals that are willing to do that. So when we go from sandbox to toolbox, we start to ask the question, that if our program is grabbing resources from everywhere, how generalized will these be when the student leaves? And you may have heard it before, but having a changed student to go back into an unchanged system, that's a place that we exist in constantly. To offset this, we're starting to have conversations around what would aftercare look like? So once we've made these deep connections with these students, and they may be with us for three days, they could be with us for 14 days, they could be with us for 20 days, which would be a suspension and then potentially flipping into a full expulsion. But if we've made that connection, might it be important for us to provide some aftercare? Can we get there? So when I start grabbing from different resources, I'll often reinforce the fact that I'm not taking and someone losing. I recognize that I'm not about to build programming based on somebody else's back. So I make sure that I meet a lot of superintendents. I make sure that my students get to meet the community partners, which could be the constable, it could be the career planner. We make sure we bring these individuals in so that the students can see this type of opportunizing the resources that are around them in clear and vivid form. I'm not gonna protect them from the decisions. I'm gonna try and make things happen for them. If they don't happen, I'm gonna walk them through how to make it happen again. And between myself and the counselor, we're constantly finding these little dark spaces in our resources that people are not necessarily paying attention to. And we scoop it up. We're not stealing from anybody. We're just making sure the stuff that there is used. And then ultimately, what does that look like to take it with you? I mentioned the aftercare. We are often in email communication with some of our students. Some are happy to leave us. Heck, just like some of you today, you'll be happy for me to get down off this pedestal. Off this pedestal. But there's a few that will reach out afterwards. They'll check in. I got a photo the other day from, um, actually it came to my Twitter feed, and all it was was, I graduated. This is us. Connect with us, please. Reach out. I thank you for letting me uh, share our story. Thank you. Chasing Squirrels podcast can be found on Podbean and iTunes. If you want to have a conversation on the podcast, please reach out to me. Probably the best way to connect with me is on Twitter. So that would be at Chris J. Clough. I also blog a little bit on WordPress. Feel free to check in on some of those topics. And I really do appreciate the time you spent with the podcast. Thank you for listening and have a fantastic evening. Thank you.